Through this series, and by the way, I'm going to close down the series today, unless something weird happens this week, and then I'm like, oh, by the way, there's one more. But um, I'm going to close down the series today on what you miss. When we take the Bible, when we get the Bible out of context and we learn it out of context, we learn certain things that we believe are true, and because of that, uh, we miss the things that are true. And we miss the depths of God's Word because of that. Um, Through the last seven weeks, we talked about divorce and remarriage, you know, the, that second class Christian thing, you know, like you're a second class Christian because you're divorced and remarried and therefore you're living in sin and all that. It's not in the Bible, guys. It's out of context and we're taught the wrong way and we miss so much when we see it that way. Um, we are, we're taught traditionally to deny ourselves. Why would God want you to deny what he has made you? He's made all things new. You are a new creation. And then what do we do? We spend our whole life trying to deny who we are now. And that is not scriptural. And it's it's wrong that we've done it. Uh, Working for heavenly rewards. You know, that spiritual bait that God puts out there. That you do all these things and you'll get these rewards in heaven. And if you do better than they do, you'll have a nicer mansion in heaven than they'll have. And you'll have better rewards than they'll have. So now we've got a Christian conversation competition going on. Sorry, it's nowhere in the scriptures. It's not there. But traditionally, we're taught that. Um, How about the one where God is punishing us for our sins? If you do something wrong, God's going to smite you because he is the God who smites. That is, that is how we see him, um, that he's after you. If, you. if you do something wrong, then God will punish you all the way to the point where he will take even maybe your child from you to get your attention. That is not scriptural. That is not the character of our God. But traditionally, we get a lot of that. And last week, we talked about being free from sin and the law. People think, well, we're still under sin and we're still under the law. We've got to keep doing all these things to make God happy. And we're still under sin. Otherwise, why would we battle with it? Um, That's out of context. We are not under sin. We are not under the law. And then two weeks ago, which, by the way, is the, the most hits we've had on this series at all for any sermon, is the sermon, Heresies of Renewed Church, um, which was the title of the sermon, The Heresies of Renewed Church. And everybody's like, ooh, let's see what that's about. Um, I go to church with a lot of heretics. And the pastor of your church, <laughs> he's a heretic. If you don't know what I'm talking about, don't just leave. If you haven't seen the sermon, watch the sermon, and then you can decide whether to leave or not. But, but check out the sermon first. But we've delved in a lot of stuff over the last seven weeks. Lately, I've been getting a lot of calls and texts about what's happening over in the Middle East. You know, what's ha- and by the way, what's happening over in the Middle East is so wrong. What they are doing to those people in Israel that is so wrong and I hate what's happening over there and I want it to stop immediately I really that is my heart I want it to stop Israel's under attack and they need a lot of help right now from any nation that will help them they they need help many innocent people are dying and it's unnecessary and it is evil the questions that I've been presented with are questions about end times events due to God's chosen people being under extreme oppression. People are watching what's happening in Israel and they say, is this end times events? Because God's chosen people are under attack. There are also concerns about the fate of our own country if we do not have Israel's back. If we don't protect Israel, what's going to happen to us? All of this stems from what tradition teaches about Israel. So today, I'm going to rattle the cage on an extremely deep traditional teaching. This one ought to provoke thought, if nothing else. Um, So much trouble. He always says amen at the most inopportune times. So, So... Why do we take the time to do this series? Why do we delve into this series and take the traditional topics and show how they're taught wrong and get the Bible back into context? Why do we do this? Why, why do this series at all? It's because it needs to be revealed what we do as people. God appropriately called us sheep. We follow so easily with what are the cool kids doing? 
Am I a cool kid or am I not a cool kid? We have to ask the cool kids in order to find out. But we follow, we follow groups. We follow people. God called us sheep and that was so appropriate because people do this. There is nothing new under the sun. We're doing what people have done for so many centuries. But we follow people and we learn things out of context and we believe they're true because we trusted the people who told us who were trusting the people who told them and then it, it just continues to go. But nobody's taking the time to look. So why, why take the time to do this series? is because it needs to, we need to, something to reveal to us that it is our job as children of God to get to know our God, not what somebody says about our God. It is our relationship, not somebody else's relationship. Grow in your relationship. But you'll have to learn about Him in order to do that. And that's why we wanted to do this series. Let me show you the scripture that all the fear is based on right now. That... Um, Israel's God's chosen people, and we will be punished if we don't have their back. God chose Abraham to create a people for himself. So let's, let's just start off. Let's look at this verse. Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your, your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will, make a great na I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. Through Abraham's line, God created the nation of Israel. Abraham's grandson, Jacob's name, was changed to Israel, and that's the name we know the nation by to this day. That's why we call, that's where the name Israel came from. They are the people of God. Since the 1800s, churches have been teaching the message of how we must protect Israel because of the curse that God will place on us if we don't. If we bless them, God will bless us. If we curse them, God will curse us. Now let's just take a st second and step back here. Are there any more punishments to hand out for sin, or did Christ pay all the punishment for sin? Christ paid completely. No more punishments for sin. Unless it's this sin, and then there's a punishment for that one, right? God curses us for cursing them? Let's get it all in context. Let's find out about this Israel topic, but let's get it in context. Even though I believe that we should help whenever and where, wherever we can. If we can help those people, let's help those people. If any nation on the earth can help those people, then they should help those people. Get in there and stand up for the innocents. Stand up for the weak. Anybody should do that. But I also think we should see the Israel topic within the context of Scripture. Once we clear things up, we'll be able to see what we're missing. So we've got to clear this up. So let's take the granddaddy of all traditional teachings and put it side by side with scripture. And let's see what God says about the topic rather than what we might already have in our minds. Is Israel God's chosen people or not? Does God favor one race over all the others? And most likely, you already have an answer to this question in your mind. The, the question I'm giving to you is, is, is it compatible with Scripture? That's, is it compatible with Scripture? So let's take a look. First, let's stir the pot. And let's see if we can get some questions to rise to the top. Let's just go ahead. Moab. Let's talk about Moab. Seems like the right time to do it. Let's talk about Moab. The Moabites were a cruel and heartless enemy of the people of Israel. Look at what God said about them to Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 3. An Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever. Now that is a fairly strict punishment right there. No Moabites will ever enter the assembly of the Lord. You're out. You're completely out. These people were sentenced to stay outside the assembly of the people of God forever. And that's exactly what God meant. They are out. But then we get to the book of Ruth, and we read verses like this. Ruth chapter 2 and verse 6. So the servant who was in charge of the reapers answered and said, It is the young Moabite woman who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. Ruth is a Moabite. 
But that's not the problem. That's not the problem. But Ruth is a Moabite. But the problem goes deeper. Jesus was born from the line of David. You know, the, the son of David. Jesus is born through the line of David. Ruth ends up marrying a man named Boaz, and then we see this unfold. Look at verse, uh, chapter 4 and verse 21. Boaz begot, begot Obed, Obed begot Jesse, and Jesse begot David. Ruth is the great-grandmother of King David, who is the line whom the Messiah comes through. Did God forget what he said? Did God forget that he said, No Moabite will enter the assembly of the Lord forever? The book of Ruth is a story of how Moabite was brought into the line of Christ. That's what the book's about. There's a redeeming story here. How do you clean that up? What, what do you do? God says, no Moabite will ever enter into the assembly of the Lord. Ruth, what are you? A Moabite. Are you in the assembly of the Lord? Yes, yes. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, sure does seem to be. How'd you get in? How did you get in? Well, I came in and married Boaz, and we had kids, and David came, and David had kids, and, and Jesus came. Like, you're not only in the assembly of the Lord. You're in the family of the Lord. What'd you do? How'd you get in? How do you clean that up? How do, how do you clean that up? The answer is found in returning the Israel topic to its context. So I'm coming to that. Let's get to that. Let's do it. Does God have favorites? Does he favor one race over the other races? The simple answer is no. God does not have favorites. He does not love one group of people over another group of people. Am I in trouble yet? Don't, am, am I, okay, I'm already in trouble. All right. In the New Testament, we have a story where God sends Peter to a Gentile's house. Let's, let's try to clean this up here. He sends Peter to a Gentile's house. The name of the Gentile was Cornelius. When he arrives, Peter sees evidence that Cornelius is saved. That's when Peter makes a very important statement concerning God's chosen people. Look at Acts chapter 10 and verse 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth, I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation. Whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. Now, Peter was a Jew. You would have thought he, of all people, would understand that God favors the Jews above every nation in the world. But he actually says the opposite. So why do we think this way? Why do, why do we think this way? What we've done is we have taken prophecies and Old Testament passages out of context, and we've built teachings that contradict the character of God. Does God love Israel? Absolutely. Absolutely. But he loves Israel the same as he loves every nation on the planet. He, he loves us all. We've got to let Scripture speak for itself. God chose Abraham's line to bring Jesus into the world. That, that is true, okay? God did choose Abraham to bring the Messiah into the world. Abraham was a good man who loved God. He was faithful, and he would teach his children to be faithful as well. And God loved him, I loved that about him. I know he will teach his children, and that is why I'm choosing him, because he'll, let this, he'll continue this on. I, I love that about him. God used the Jewish people as a physical illustration pointing to a spiritual family. Look at what happened when a group of fa Jewish Pharisees approached Jesus on the topic. Let's look at something that Jesus dealt with. Look at what Jesus says in John chapter 8 and verse 37. I know that you are Abraham's descendants. But you seek to kill me, because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. Jesus just confirmed, look at that, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. Jesus just confirmed that these people are of the bloodline of Abraham. These are Jews. This is of the nation of Israel. This is of Abraham's line. But he separates them from himself. He was pointing out that they had two different fathers, even though they were all descendants of Abraham. Jesus was, 
and these Jews that he's talking to are descendants of Abraham. So they felt like they needed to clarify things for him. Look at verse 39. They answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. Jesus is stirring the pot. That's terrible. Jesus is stirring the pot a little bit here. Now he's pointing out that they're not children of Abraham. You see that? Abraham is our father. Well, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But that's not what you do. They may have the proper DNA, but they are not part of God's chosen people. Jesus is separating these two topics. Abraham was chosen because of his faith, not his pedigree. I choose you because of your faith. I choose you because of your trust in me. It's not because of your bloodline. Jesus is pointing out that his true children would be those who share the family resemblance. You don't match Abraham at all. Yeah, but we are of the bloodline of Abraham. Yeah, but you're not of Abraham. That's when these Jews realized that Jesus was speaking about Abraham's connection with God. They pick up on this. So they insist on clarifying their position a little bit more. Look at the next verse, uh, uh, verse 41. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we were not born of fornication. We have one father, God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. And then two verses later, we have this, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. Jesus just told these descendants of Abraham that they were not of the people of God. Their physical DNA matched perfectly, but their spiritual DNA did not match Jesus Christ at all. They were of their father, the devil. Jesus told Jews that they were not God's people. Did he not know about the traditions? Yeah, he knows. He tells them, you are not of God. You are not God's chosen people. Yeah, but our father is Abraham. Yeah, but you are not the children of Abraham. <clears throat> this doesn't match very well with today's traditional teachings at all. So who are God's chosen people? It was supposed to be those who were children of Abraham. Remember, the promise was for his descendants, for his, you will have children as the sands of the sea, as the stars of the sky. And there's a promise through your children that you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. You know, you know the, the whole passage. It's, it's his line. What about the promises given to Abraham concerning his descendants? Well, here it is. Look at Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Are you Christ's? How many Jews do we have in this room? Uh-oh, not one, not one Jew is sitting in here. Nobody, not one of you can say, well, I'm a direct descendant of Abraham. Not one of you can. But that verse right there says, if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. You. I know I'm Christ's. Guess what that makes me? Abraham's descendant. With God, there is no Jew, no Greek, just family. Just family. If you are Christ, then you are Abraham's seed. Salvation has always been by grace through faith. Always. How about under the law? Still by grace through faith. The law could not save anyone. The law just pointed us to the one who could. That is what the law was designed to do. 
So it's always been by grace through faith. Never through bloodline, never by works. God did use a physical nation to get the light out to the rest of the world. But the message was never about, about partiality. Oh, I love them more than you. No, no. It was never about that. God does not have favorites. He is no respecter of persons. That's why he says, in my family, there's neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, bond nor free. No, you're all just my kids. You're all one. Scripture actually shuts this traditional teaching down if we only take the time to read it. Look at what Paul, who was a Jew, says in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 2 and verse 28. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not from men, but from God. That's a pretty straightforward statement right there. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. I don't care about your bloodline. Well, who's a Jew? Oh, he's a Jew who is one inwardly. The one who has had his old heart and old spirit cut away and has been given a new heart and a new spirit. Now that's, now those are Jews. Those are Jews. Paul's explaining who God's chosen people really are in a book written to a bunch of Gentiles. You want to know who the true Jews are? You want to know who true Israel is? Check this out. It's not about the outward. It's about the inward. It is Christ's spiritual bloodline that makes you part of the family, not Abraham's physical bloodline. It's always been by grace through faith. Back when Abraham and Sarah weren't able to have children, God promised that they would have a son who would bring about the Messiah. And God did promise them that. Because it was taking so long, Abraham and Sarah did what people do when things are taking so long. They decide to take care of it themselves. So Abraham chose to have a son through Hagar, Sarah's handmaid. This son's name was Ishmael, and he was also a true descendant of Abraham. That's how that works. Dad has son. This is the descendant of the dad. It's not real hard. That one's super easy. So Ishmael is a direct descendant of Abraham. The problem was that he had no connection to God's promise. Ishmael was not a son born of promise. He was born through self-effort. Now we've got a different picture. This wasn't the picture of salvation that God was trying to make. I'm giving you salvation through promise, not through self-effort. It's by grace you're saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's not of works or self-effort or you'd be able to brag about it. It's not self-effort. Abraham and Sarah had a son through self-effort. Direct descendant of Abraham. Not the son I promised. You're not according to promise. Eventually, Abraham and Sarah had their son Isaac, who was according to promise. This is the one that God promised they would have, is Isaac. It is those who are born to God through promise that are brought into the line of Abraham. That's a shadow that God gave us through Isaac. You're born through promise. And that's the fulfillment God gave us through Christ. Paul does an excellent job of explaining this in Romans chapter 9. Please open the scriptures and look. He does an incredible job here. Look at Romans chapter 9 and verse 6. But it is not that the word of God has, no, has taken no effect, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel, nor are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham. But in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. Who's God's chosen people? Everybody starting to see it? It's not the direct bloodline to Abraham. As he said in Galatians, you, if you are Christ's, you are the seed of Abraham. If you are in Christ, Christ is true Israel. 
That is true Israel. It's Jesus Christ. So many people are worried anytime the news reveals that there is trouble in the Middle East. They panic. Could this be it? Is this what the Bible's talking about? They believe that turmoil is pointing to the end times. Tradition teaches that Jews will one day have to pay for what they did to Jesus Christ. That's the explanation for why there needs to be a great tribulation, which, by the way, I'm not going into it, but is also out of context. It's said that a future generation of Jewish people will have to face the wrath of God for what they did to his son. But this is the epitome of twisting scripture. Jesus willingly gave his life as a sacrifice. The Jews did not take it. He willingly died for you. It was his choice, not their choice. In order to believe this, that the Jews will have to pay for what they did to Jesus Christ, you would have to completely ignore verses like this. Look at Ezekiel chapter 18 and verse 20. The soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself, and the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. A future generation of Jews will not have to face the punishment for the sins of their fathers. It's, it cannot happen. That's unscriptural. Wait, but I thought, I know, I used to think too. Then I learned to think, and I don't think of that anymore. Just think. Don't just obey what you're told. Think. Get the scripture in context. Also, a group of people living in the Middle East who reject Jesus Christ as their Messiah are not God's chosen people. It can't work that way. Do you believe in Jesus? Absolutely not. We reject the whole idea of Jesus being the Messiah. Yeah, that looks like the people God would say, yeah, those are my kids. It doesn't really match, does it? It doesn't match up. Just as the Jews that Jesus said weren't of the children of Abraham. Yeah, maybe physically you are. But you missed it. You missed it. You're not God's chosen people. You just, Ancestry.com works out for you. But salvation does not. God's chosen people are those who are children of promise. And what was the promise? It was Jesus Christ. Those who are in Christ are of Abraham's seed. God's people are those born through promise, not those with a specific bloodline. Jewish people can be in the family of God just as any person of any nation on this planet can be of the family of God. They are completely eligible. How, are, how can I become a child of God? Through Jesus Christ. A Jew can do it. A Gentile can do it. Anybody on this planet can be in the family of God. But it's by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. Th that's how salvation happens. Let's take a look again at that verse that strikes fear into the hearts of those under traditional teaching. But this time, let's take it one line farther. Look at Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. There's the promise. There's the promise. God's people were never confined to a specific nationality. All the families of the earth. All the families of the earth can be brought into one family. That's how a Moabite was able to enter into the assembly of the Lord in the book of Ruth. That's how she got in. Ruth left one family behind by placing her faith in the God of Israel. A Moabite didn't enter into the assembly of the Lord. A child of God did. Through faith, she was taken out of one category and she was placed into another. That's also what happens the day you get saved. You're removed from one category of sinner and you are now placed into the category of saint. And what do you look like? And they, man, there's a family resemblance going on. You look like you just might be part of God's family. 
the line of Christ. You see, the bloodline isn't Abraham's, it's Jesus's. And it's not physical. It's the sacrificial bloodline. I gave everything for you to bring you in. And once you're saved, if you are in Christ, you are of the seed of Abraham. Why? Because Abraham had faith. Now that's what we're talking about, not DNA. Not DNA. The family of God only consists of the children of Abraham. That is true. It only consists of God's chosen people. But here's the good news. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 7. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are sons of Abraham. What has been taught for centuries is that God has a specific plan for those who are Jews. But God's plan has always been the same. Yes, Jews were a special nation to God, and God did bless them, absolutely. Their purpose was to shine the light to the other nations. Abraham's family was a physical line that the Messiah would come through. Those were his people. That was his physical family. Yes, the Messiah was going to come through that physical line. You could trace it back so you could say, wow, the promise, the, you know, the prophecy matches perfectly. He is a son of David. He's a son of Abraham. It goes back. It connects. So Jesus is, that's just one of the many prophecies that Jesus is who he says he was. Is because it connected in the bloodline. But it was through that family that all the nations of the earth would be blessed. Through that physical family. Jesus Christ was that blessing for all the nations of the earth. So who are God's chosen people? Who are the true children of God? John chapter 1 and verse 11. He came to his own, you know, his physical family. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. To those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. So what do we miss when we see this topic through the traditional lens? What do we miss? Because what did we miss? What did we miss when we saw this topic through the traditional lens rather than context? What do we miss? We miss an incredible picture of whosoever will may come. We miss it. Because for some reason, you think in your mind, traditionally, I am just so glad that God brought me into the family, but I know I'm a stepchild. Because he loves them more than he loves me. And suddenly, again, we have second-class Christians. Whosoever will may come, and whoever's in crisis of the line of, of the seed of Abraham. That makes you first class first class. We miss the fact that we have a God who shows no partiality. And you know what that means? That means you were always plan A. You were plan A. Oh wait, I was going to be grafted in. That's, isn't that the idea that I'm just grafted into Israel and that's how it works? Direct bloodline to Jesus Christ because of salvation. Yeah, you're brought into the family of Abraham. You're kind of grafted in in the picture because you're a Gentile brought into a Jewish picture. But you are a direct child of God because you're connected with the blood of Christ. Spiritual DNA matches perfectly and the results are in. You're his kid. You're his kid. I'm just part of his kid. No, you're all his kid. Perfect match. Perfect match. We miss out on understanding that the end times passages, we miss out on understanding those passages correctly. We're looking at all these end time things and go, okay, okay, war's happening over in the Middle East, so that means, that means they're still fighting. That means, you know, when Isaac and Ishmael were born, and God says, man, those kids are going to have problems forever. They're always going to battle with each other. You know what they're still doing? That. That is what's going on. 
Does it mean end times? It doesn't mean prophecies all coming together? It doesn't mean that? No. No. We miss out on understanding the end times passages correctly when we see it out of context because we impose a picture on Scripture that should have never been there. My prayer is that through this past seven weeks, we can see the importance of reading Scripture within context. Because look at what we do as people. I did it for so many years. The majority of my life was spent up to this point getting it wrong. I got it wrong. But look how clear those passages are about God's chosen people. Look at how clear that is. God's word is the final authority. It's not what men say God says. It's what God actually says that's important. God has so much for us. Let's not miss it. Let's not miss it. When we look at tradition, when we look at Scripture through a traditional lens, we've missed so much. We have missed so much. So let's start understanding. If, you, if you're anything like me, if I sat through a series like this, and I wasn't the one preaching, and I was just sitting, and this was the first time I've heard it, you know what I would think? <laughs> this guy's crazy. But, <laughs> inopportune timing. That's where you get the amens. But I would think, this guy's crazy. But I would also think, man, those verses sure do seem to say it, though. It sure does seem to say that. And I would be forced to search Scripture daily to find out whether these things were so. Now that job's yours. Search the scriptures. Get it in context. We miss so much when we look at the Bible through a traditional lens. Let's not miss it.